this video we're talking about how to find the extrema of a function on a closed interval and in this particular problem we've been given the function f of x is equal to sine squared of x and we've been asked to find the extrema of this function over the closed interval 0 to 3. So what are we talking about when we say the extrema of a function first of all? We're talking about the maxima and minima of the function so its highest points and its lowest points. We're looking for the extrema of this function, but only those extrema that lie inside this closed interval 0 to 3. So this is like any other optimization problem where you're asked to find local max and local min, except that we have this closed interval. And when that's the case, we're going to have to test the endpoints of the interval, x equals 0 and x equals 3, to say whether or not those endpoints represent the highest value that the function attains or the lowest value that the function attains inside the interval. In other words, we're going to have to pay attention to critical points, but also to the endpoints points of the interval, in this case x equals 0 and x equals 3. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the derivative of our original function f of x. Let's first rewrite our function f of x as sine of x quantity squared. And this doesn't change the value of the function at all. We've just brought the exponent outside. These two functions are actually exactly the same. But this is easier for us to take the derivative of because we can see that it's now a power function. So to take the derivative, we're going to say f prime of x is the derivative. And we're going to use power rule, which means that we're going to bring the exponent down in front here. So we're going to bring the exponent down in front to we're going to apply chain rule. And remember, chain rule tells us take the derivative of the outside function first, ignoring the inside function completely. And then, once you've done that, multiply by the result of the inside function. So in this case, our inside function is sine of x. So we're just going to ignore that for a second. We're going to deal with the larger power function that's defined by this exponent, which means we bring the 2 out in front. We just leave the sine x alone for a second. And then according to power rule, we subtract 1 from the exponent. So 2 minus 1 gives us 1. But now, according to chain rule, we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. So we have to multiply by cosine of x. So when we simplify this, there's no reason to write this 1 as an exponent. That's redundant. So we can just call this 2 sine of x cosine of x. This is our derivative function. Now, in order to find critical points, we need to set this derivative function equal to 0. So we're going to set it equal to 0. We can go ahead and divide both sides by 2 and get 0 equals sine of x times cosine of x. Now, in the same way that you use 0 theorem to factor one side and set each factor individually equal to 0, here we have two factors. One is sine of x and one is cosine of x. So we can set those individually equal to 0 because if sine of x is equal to 0, this right-hand side will all be 0 and the equation will be true. Alternately, if cosine of x is equal to 0, then we'll multiply it by sine of x. We'll get 0 on the right-hand side and the equation will be true. So we can say this equation is true if sine of x is equal to 0 and or if cosine of x is equal to 0 and then we can solve these equations individually. So what we can say if we look at a unit circle is that sine of x is going to be equal to 0 if x is equal to 0 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, etc. And it would also be equal to 0 at negative pi, negative 2 pi, so we can have it going in both directions. For cosine of x equals 0, that equation is going to be true when x is equal to pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, dot dot dot, in that direction, or in this direction here, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, etc. So all of these values are potential critical points. But here's where the interval comes in for the first time. We only care about the critical points that lie inside of this interval x equals 0 to x equals 3. If there's a critical point for the function, but it's outside of the interval, it's irrelevant because we're only interested in maxima and minima that lie inside of this interval. So what we can do is cross out any critical points that don't lie in this interval. So first of all, negative 2 pi, well, that's less than 0, so is negative pi, so these are gone. 0 here is at the left endpoint of the interval, which means it can't be a critical point inside of this interval because the function can't change direction there because we're not looking at the part of the function that's defined to the left of x equals 0. So we can't have a critical point here. It's already represented by the endpoint. 
Now we know pi is equal to 3.14. Well, the right end point of our interval is 3, which means pi is greater than 3. It lies outside of the interval, so this isn't going to be relevant either. And when we multiply 3.14 by 2 or by 3, those are going to be irrelevant also. They're all going to be greater than 3 or outside of the interval on the right side here. So what about these values over here? Well, negative pi over 2, that's a negative number. That's going to be to the left of 0 outside of our interval, so that's gone. Pi over 2, that value, if we do it on our calculator or in our heads, it's about 1.57. That is inside of our interval 0 to 3, so that one's going to stay. But 3 pi over 2 is greater than 4 already. That's going to be outside of our interval on the right-hand side also. So anything larger here is going to lie outside of the interval. Therefore, the only critical point that we care about is the value x equals pi. So now what we want to do, as with any extrema problem, we want to go ahead and draw ourselves a little simple number line here and we always want to define the endpoints of the interval we've been given so we'll say the endpoints 0 and 3 and we'll include any critical numbers that are still inside of the interval in this case the only one is pi over 2 so we'll put that right in the middle here pi over 2 now we know that x equals pi over 2 is probably going to be a critical point where the function changes direction, but in order to say whether it's a local maximum or a local minimum, we need to figure out what the function is doing to the left of pi over 2 and what it's doing to the right of pi over 2. In other words, whether it's increasing or decreasing on the left and right hand sides. So in order to do that, we're going to use test values to the left and right of pi over 2. So pi over 2 is about 1.57, which means we could use a test value over here of 1 and a test value over here of 2, because 1 is between 0 and pi over 2, and 2 is between pi over 2 and 3. But we're going to be plugging our test values into our derivative function 2 sine x cosine x, so it'll be easier if we use values in terms of pi. So let's use here pi over 4, because pi over 4 is greater than 0 but less than pi over 2. And over here, we'll use 3 pi over 4, because that value is greater than pi over 2 but less than 3. Okay, so now we're going to be using the first derivative test to figure out the increasing and decreasing behavior of the original function. And remember to use the first derivative test, we have to use the first derivative, we have to plug our test values into the first derivative. So we're going to be plugging these values into f prime. So let's go ahead first and say f prime of pi over 4, our first test value, and when we do that, we'll plug it into our derivative function and we'll get 2 times sine of pi over 4 times cosine of pi over 4. Now if we simplify here, sine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2, cosine of pi over 4 is also square root of 2 over 2, and when we simplify this here, what we're going to get if we multiply across the numerators, square root of 2 times square root of 2 is just 2, so we can cancel this out, multiply by 2, and then we're going to get this 2 to cancel with this 2 from the numerator and denominator, and this 2 in the denominator to cancel with this 2 in the numerator, so what we're going to end up with is 1. The value we get specifically is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is whether or not this result here is positive or negative, and the fact that this is a positive value, we have positive 1, means that the function is increasing over the interval 0 to pi over 2. Now we need to test 3 pi over 4, so we'll say f prime of 3 pi over 4, our other test value, is going to be equal to 2 times sine of 3 pi over 4 times cosine of 3 pi over 4. And in this case, sine of 3 pi over 4 is square root 2 over 2, but cosine of 3 pi over 4 is negative square root 2 over 2. So when we simplify here, square root of 2 times square root of 2 is going to give us 2, so we can put a 2 out here to replace those two. Then we're going to get this 2 to cancel with this one, and this one to cancel with this one, and you can see we're just going to be left with negative 1. And again, the specific value is not important. What's important is that we got a negative value, which means that the original function is decreasing in this interval. What the first derivative test gives us then is a really clear picture of what's happening at pi over 2. As the function is getting close to pi over 2 on the left hand side, it's increasing, it's going up, it gets to pi over 2 and then it changes direction and it starts going down, which means we can literally see the top of this peak here where the function peaks at pi over 2, the function has a local maximum at pi over 2. 
So because the function is increasing in the entire interval 0 to pi over 2, and then decreasing in the entire interval pi over 2 to 3, because there were no other critical points, there were only these two intervals, so pi over 4 told us the behavior of the function over the entire interval 0 to pi over 2, and 3 pi over 4 told us the behavior of the original function over the entire interval pi over 2 to 3. So we've got increasing and decreasing. So the function's value at x equals 0 could not possibly be larger than the function's value at pi over 2 because it's starting low down here and increasing the entire time until it gets to pi over 2. Then it starts decreasing the entire time until it gets to x equals 3. So the function's value at x equals 0 and x equals 3 could not possibly be larger than the function's value at pi over 2. So what we can conclude then is that the function has its largest value in the interval at pi over 2. So we can say global maximum and we don't even have to say local because since the interval is closed and we know we're only looking at this particular part of the function we know this is the absolute maximum so we can call it the absolute max or the global max and that's at x equals pi over 2. We're going to plug that value into the original function at the end of the problem to get the corresponding y value so we can give the coordinate point of the global maximum of this function in the interval. But now we need to check the endpoints of the interval x equals 0 and x equals 3. We just need to plug those endpoints into the original function to see what the value of the function is at each endpoint. So we're going to take x equals 0 and plug it into f of x. So we're going to say f of 0 is going to be equal to, and we'll plug it into this version right here, sine of x quantity squared. So we'll say sine of 0 quantity squared. Well, sine of 0 is 0. 0 squared is still 0. So f of 0 is going to be 0. What about f of 3, the value of the function at x equals 3? Well, we plug 3 into the original function, and so we'll say that's going to be sine of 3 quantity squared. Now if we use our calculators to find sine of 3 quantity squared, what we see is that it's about 0 0.0199. Since 0 is less than 0 0.0199, the lowest value of the function occurs at x equals 0 because that's where we found this 0 value here. So that means that the global minimum or the absolute minimum is going to be at 0, x equals 0, the end point of the interval. We already plugged that into the original function and we found 0. So in other words, the function passes through the origin, the point 0, 0, and that's the global minimum of the function over the interval. So now our last step is just to plug pi over 2 into the original function to find the associated y value. So we're going to say f of pi over 2 is equal to sine of pi over 2 quantity squared. Well, sine of pi over 2 is 1. 1 squared is 1. So we can say pi over 2 comma 1. So the global maximum occurs at x equals pi over 2, and the value of the function there is 1. So the largest value that the function attains in the interval is y equals 1, and it gets there at pi over 2. So there's the global maximum and the global minimum, and that's how you find the extrema of a function over a closed interval.